From Buffalo Wild Wings in Moorhead, welcome to Bench Warmers. Today's featured guests are sports reporter from the Fargo Forum, Eric Peterson, Midco Sports Network basketball analyst, Greg Steeman, Minnesota State Moorhead head football coach, Steve Lockway, and our host, Midco Sports Network's Tom Neiman. Hello, welcome again to Bench Warmers. We are at Buffalo Wild Wings in Moorhead, Minnesota. Another fabulously intelligent crew we've put together here. We'll talk some Minnesota State University uh, Moorhead football with Coach Steve Lockway in a moment. But first, uh, the national topics of the week. NBA Finals have just completed as we sit here on a Monday afternoon. And if it was a fix by the NBA, it was a beautiful job because it got to a Game 7 and it was good and Cleveland finally wins it. Your thoughts on uh, LeBron finally getting it done, Coach? Well, I, I mean, uh, I'll tell you what, the guy uh, was in incredible, you know, the last four or five games of the series, and and uh, I don't think there's any question he deserved it. He certainly had a better surrounding cast this year than he did last year. Irving was really uh, impressive, and uh, as a team, I just think they uh, they really came together and did, did what they needed to do, so credit to them. Uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention they did hold Golden State to 39% field goal percentage. Uh, so I think defense does matter, believe it or not. And at the end of the game, it wasn't pretty, as you point out. But One for the last 19 possessions, there was a basket made, and that was Irving's three over Curry. Pete? I just think it's time, you know, all the LeBron haters, it's it's time to maybe peel back a little bit. I know yeah. he's three, three and four in finals uh, record, but... Do people just discount when you don't make the finals? I mean, some people might be 4-0 and 3-0 in the finals, but they've only been there three times. So I, I just think he was amazing, triple-double. And the, to me, the trademark play, you know, the three-pointer is big by Kyrie Irving with the block. Oh, just yeah. show the, the hustle, the athleticism. And, and to me, if, if Andre Godala makes that layup, maybe it's a different ending. But yeah. for a guy who can rebound, you know, distribute the ball, score in defense, he's about as good a package as you're going to have. I would agree. I thought the block was phenomenal. I mean, just uh, the heart, the, the determination of the importance for him to, to win that game and to, and to lead by example. And so I thought that was, that was critical. I thought it was pivotal. Uh, I think great for Cleveland. Uh, you know, I think the best thing they had going before that was uh, Major League, you know, back to movies. <laughs> and that was the last maybe championship you could maybe call it. And so good for them to get a legitimate championship and for their city and for so their organization. Decide, so if he decides to go Michael Jordan, maybe try football, would you use him at tight end? Oh, we'll use him wherever he wants. <laughs> Quarterback, tight end, you name it. And about, about halfway through the series, I just totally turned around. And LeBron, it seemed like, did too, where he – he quit scowling at everything. He stopped complaining about every call that went on, and he just played. And he was phenomenal in those last three games. And, and I became, I switched around, Eric, and went from a hater to a, a LeBron lover. And it, it just seemed right. Well, two things. One, the Draymond Green suspension, I think, kind of gave Cleveland a glimmer yeah. of hope. And then when Clay Thompson called LeBron out in a, in a press conference, basically called him a crybaby, yeah. it seemed he like quit crying and started playing. So maybe that was another thing that played a role in the turnaround. It was fair. And the first team ever to come back from being down 3-1 to one in the finals and not only push it to a game seven, but finally win it. That was, that was phenomenal. And, and you forget sometimes, we're, we're watching these, these pros, we watch them for years. At the same time, they're in their mid to late 20s, maybe 30 years old. Hey, they, they still have time to mature. They still have time to grow. And I think, as you t you mentioned, I think LeBron James has continued to mature and become even more of a leader than he was throughout the course of his career. All right. As Coach Lockway points out, so Cleveland's drought is over. Now the last major city that has at least three of the big four sports, football, basketball, hockey, and baseball, Minnesota is next in line now that hasn't won a championship, the longest championship drought going back to the 1991 World Series win for the Twins. So, out of those four teams in Minnesota now, who, who is most likely to break this drought that is now the longest drought in major sports championship history? Twins, Wolves, Vikings, Wild. Who's got the best chance in maybe the next couple of years to actually win a championship? I'm going with the Wild. Really? Yep, I was going on a limb. I'll go with the Wild. Um, I would love for my dad's sake to say the Vikings and have him be the Vikings, but uh, I think he's been burned too many times, and I don't know if he can get his hopes up if they even got to the Super Bowl, if he can get his hopes up one more time. So a wild, fresh start for him. I'll put my money there. We were talking about this before. There's that angst with Minnesota fans, especially the Vikings. And now now it's maybe legitimized yeah. a little bit that we can say, oh, we've got the longest drought. But 
A lot of Vikes fans that think maybe Teddy Bridgewater can get him there. What do you think? I'll even rank them. I'll go Vikings one at the best chance. Okay. I'll give Wolves the second best chance at two. I put Wild at three, and I put the Twins at four. The Twins are just kind of a train wreck right now. Yeah. And to, to rebuild that franchise, there's so many things they have to do, and, and it's harder in baseball. I think basketball, you can do a quick fix. The Wolves have a guy like Carl Anthony Towns, Andrew Wing is the build around. And I think the Vikings right now have a very good defense, and you saw Denver last year. You can get by with the average to above average quarterbacking if you have a great defense. All right. I, I'll go with the Vikings on paper. You know, if you would have asked me a year ago, we'd all be saying the Twins, right? You know, they're, they're headed towards a potential playoff, but at the same time, it's funny how things turn around. But I, I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll say Vikings, I'll say Wild, and then I'll say the uh, Wolves, and then the Twins. And you talk about uh, the, what the Wolves have put together over the last couple of years. Maybe an up-and-coming team. The NBA draft is coming up on Thursday, and there's all this talk about Minnesota maybe trading Andrew Wiggins away. The Wolves have the number five pick. What do you think they should do with it? I, I wouldn't trade Wiggins. I mean, if they can get someone like Chris Dunn, that's great. Maybe they trade Rubio. And there's also talk about Butler. Who knows if, if he's available? I think you try to trade the five pick to get a veteran. You can only have so many 19, 20, 21 year olds on a team. Yeah. If they keep the pick, maybe draft a guy like Buddy Heald because the team definitely needs some shooting. All right. I think you stick with the pick. I, I'm opposite of Eric. I, I say you stay young. You, uh, you keep it that way. You build those guys. And hopefully you get a nucleus that, that sets you up long term. I like that too. With Buddy Heald is out there from Oklahoma. I love him. A guy that can shoot that just the way the NBA game is going, having a guy that can shoot it like that. But I think you all agree that you've got to keep Towns and Wiggins. They're doing a lot of things right in the last couple of years. Keep that momentum going and maybe go get another younger guy right now. Well, Great. I mean, oh, I was going to say they look a lot like Oklahoma City did when they had Westbrook and Durant to build around. Yeah. Granted, a little bit different dynamic with Wiggins not being a point guard, but they, they have their two kind of potential stars there, and then you just build around that. Very strong nucleus, and they're, they have a coach that's really going to – they're, they're going to defend, and it'll make them much more competitive much quicker. It's just going to be fun to listen to Vikings fans especially and Minnesota fans. <laughs> that we've got the drought now, and we need to get a championship over the next couple of years. It's going to be great. We will uh, touch on the U.S. Open uh, when we come back and the fiasco that that could have been and almost was over the weekend. And uh, we're going to talk some Minnesota State University Moorhead Dragon football with Coach Lockley when we come back. Benchwarmers on Midco Sports Network is presented by Buffalo Wild Wings. Welcome back to Bench Warmers at Buffalo Wild Wings here in Moorhead, Minnesota. Let's talk about some Dragon football with head coach Steve Lockway and the Dragons coming off their first winning season uh, since 2006, just the second winning season since 1999. Got it going in the right direction. You'll be going into your sixth year at Moorhead. Uh, as the head coach coming up this fall. What, what's going right? What do you get going on right now? Well, I think we got a lot of things going in the right direction. I think uh, we've rallied kind of the community behind us. I think um, our scholarships have risen, which means, you know, obviously the, the, the alumni are behind us. I think the, the university itself is behind us. I think our recruiting has really continued to get better and better every year. That's probably been the most exciting thing that, you know, we, we keep saying, well, we got this young talent. Well, every year we get more and more talent that's better and better and so i think um that cycle that's going through is really something that's been exciting and obviously we're starting to reap some of the rewards on the football field now. and you said when you first got there five years ago you almost had to go recruit the community and the supporters before you could go even look at players right that, we really that, did talk about changing the culture that was the big thing we, we spent a lot of time uh, working for alumni support for for community support and, and so many people get caught up and we're asking me what offense you're going to run what defense this that or the other thing and it all comes down to culture those are the things that we attack from the get-go those are the things that uh, impact what you do every single day and, and what you do every day ultimately determines your success and so we attack the the culture piece as hard as we could and and really want to set the foundation to be successful for for the big picture all right E, what have you seen just in the last five years in the kind of the transition of the Dragon football program? Well, I think, like I said, it starts with reputation. I think their reputation's been built up. It starts with funding, nine scholarships when he took over. Now it's 28th, the league, the league maximum for scholarships. And just little things like uh, Shields Field, they have a new turf field. Last year they opened the season on a Thursday night, had a big crowd. Just There was just excitement around the program that wasn't there five, six, seven years ago. So you just see some of that stuff. and. Just player retention too, you know, the roster 
it's solid. It's there's roster retention with years past. You'd see 80, you know, players on a roster, and maybe spring 15, 20, those guys would be gone. So just the combination of all those things going on. Greg, you've been impressed by the way this has come together too, huh? Without question, and it's it's hard, you know, with a larger program, a large number program. Credit to Coach Lacqua building that culture and, and in order to do that you know it's such an instant gratification society to convince a young man sometimes that you may not play until your third or fourth year in this program and you may redshirt and you talk about retention they have to buy into that program they have to have a reason to want to stay around and be a part of something special and i also you know credit coach Lockwood and his staff there's no question the the visibility and and the the the, the, the way that program is perceived has changed dramatically. I also give credit to your boss, Doug Peters. I'll tell you what, that guy has uh, enthusiasm galore, and I think he's had a lot to do with a lot of these, these promotional events. And so credit him. He knows he's only as good as the people he hires. I know he's the one who hired yourself and Coach Walthall. And so I think it's great. Great leadership is also something that's, that's been uh, very positive. But, but credit to you and your staff, your, your culture, and, and the perception of your program is so much different than what it was six years ago. And to your point, like you said, you know, you, you, you can have the talent on the field and winning on the field, but getting people in the stands now, you know, at football games they have stuff like the T-shirt cannon and the giveaways, which which a coach probably doesn't care about too much, but it helps get people out to the games. and It's just become part of sports now. It's not just what's on the field. There's got to be kind of an entertainment package. I feel there's a little bit more of an event feel. There's, you know, some tailgating going on at, you know, near Alex Nemzik Stadium that wasn't going on in years past. So even some of that off the field stuff, I think, has been, you know, improved here in the last few years. And you, and you have to maintain that, and, and that has been established now, but that kind of frees you up a little bit more now to concentrate more on what goes on on the field. Hasn't well, it? absolutely. And when we started, we had this broad piece of all these corrections we needed to make and get fixed in all the different areas in our program. So it's starting to hone in a little bit more each each year. And so it's allowed me to, to get to where I can make sure I focus on just coach the team. Just coach the team and not get caught up in you know, getting the community rallying, the fundraising, and, and that stuff's important, but we're taking it to another level on the field. And so that needs uh, more intention and it needs more um, focus from me and from our staff and so it's been good for us to transition that and and really continue to move things forward especially in recruiting recruiting is really the name of the game and and it's a time thing you have to keep putting in your time uh your reputation as he said but you got to put the work in also and you're, you're a north coast state guy played there coach there and that monster sits across the river here. Do you recruit directly against North Coast State, or is is there a dividing line between them and you? Well, there's a definite dividing line. You know, they're looking at a, a much higher level of, of athlete than, than what we are. But there's there's some crossovers of guys that they're wanting to walk on, and we think can be really good players yeah. within our conference and with our program. So there's definitely that. The proximity certainly plays a part in that. So there's definitely times we come in contact, but it's been great. Um, their success feels fuels the success around here. It fuels the, the want for young kids to play football, stay involved yeah. in the football game, and that really is the ultimate backbone of our recruiting. And so if young men are excited about playing football in seventh grade all the way through 12th grade, hey, we got a shot at good football players that we can recruit. I, I used to bring out that, the walk-on piece. What, how has the preferred walk-ons changed your recruiting? Not only NDSU, but UND. A lot of these Division One FCS programs have that preferred walk-on that maybe would have been a Division Two player. Is that a new challenge in recruiting that maybe wasn't there five, ten years ago? Absolutely, because everybody uh, has this Division One dream and they want to be there. And you know, I think their dream is really to be out there and be playing. And and, and that doesn't always happen for the walk-ons. And so being able to see, do I want to do that and and fight that battle that I pro probably won't win, but I could win, or do I want to come here and, and say, hey, I can get a great experience here and and be a be a good football player and make a name for myself at Division Two. Yeah, that's that is an interesting point. It really yes. is to yep. to get the kids that they have that dream, but they want to play. Kids want to play when they get to the college level, and you give them a very good opportunity for really good players from around this area Absolutely. to get to play. Yeah, and I, I think some of it is just all understanding. I don't think it changes anywhere in life, but understanding that your dreams do kind of change, you know. And at one point, my dream was to just coach at North Dakota State, and then you know what. I couldn't make that work and balance it with my family and, 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 and being able to be the husband and father that I wanted to be. And so I had to kind of adjust the dreams that I wanted. And so it works. I think it's no different for, for kids. That might be the dream. But as it's starting to shape out to go, OK, yeah. what is this dream really going to look like? And how do I want to make adjustments? All right. Dragons 6-5 and five last season, beat Winona, beat Augustana, open up at University of Sioux Falls. 
I think that's one you're gonna, you can go get. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will definitely have our hands full when we're in, in Sioux Falls, I know that for a fact. All right, Dragon Football uh, on the rise under Coach Lockway here in Moorhead. We'll be right back, talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. Open in golf, how Dustin Johnson got the win despite uh, some funky rules that were going on there, and the Stanley Cup, is it coming here to Moorhead sometime this summer? We'll talk about that when we come back. Benchwarmers on Midco Sports Network is presented by Buffalo Wild Wings. Welcome back to Bench Warmers. Let's talk a little bit about the U.S. Open in golf, which just uh, finished up over the weekend. Dustin Johnson wins it, his first major championship. Great performance by him, but there was some controversy that everybody wanted to talk about. He was on the fifth hole, went up to address a putt. His ball moved a little bit. He said he didn't touch it. The rules officials then thought about it for seven more holes. They approach him on the 12th hole, and they say, we might assess you a penalty on this. We're not sure. Greg Steeman, it blew his mind, and he's a stickler for the rules, but this, this was ridiculous, wasn't it, Greg? Well, I, I think beyond ridiculous. I mean, he, first of all, Dustin Johnson removes his name from the greatest players not to have a major, fights through all that, and when you think about it, when you try to equate it to other sports, you know, Eric was talking about earlier, equate it to someone saying, well, we're going to review that, th that, that shot and see if it was a three-pointer, and we'll let you know after the game. Yeah. It totally changes how you approach. If Dustin Johnson had been one shot ahead or tied, you know, prior to the ruling, go walking down 18, how does he play that hole? And, and to, to sit there and say, well, you don't understand, it's the rules of golf. No, I understand. There's no common sense being applied whatsoever. Give the guy, you know, get it off his mind. Either penalize him or not. But don't tell him you're going to let him know after the round. I just thought it's absolutely ridiculous in this day and age of technology and the ability to make a ruling to somehow leave that hanging out there. Credit Dustin Johnson for not letting it bother him and, and finishing with no doubt. And that shot he stuck on 18 yeah. you know, to, to finish the tournament off, good for him. Yeah, especially a, with the history that he has yeah, of the rules. I'm committee. not a golf fan, but you got to make a ruling. Like To his point, what if it ended tied? And all of a sudden he's thinking he's going to a playoff. They go to clubhouse. Oh, by the way, we took a shot penalty. You lost. I mean, it, it's just <laughs> and they did ridiculous. end up assessing him a one shot penalty, which they shouldn't have anyway. They got it wrong even in yeah. the end after all that. But there is no other equivalent, I don't think. There's not anything in football that would no. There's but some goofy I would, calls in football, but still, I would just say hats off to him. Yeah. yeah. Look, look at Lowry. Look at how many people in golf, and we're talking about the best of the best. Yep. Fade on a Sunday in a major. Yep. Now you throw this into yeah. his lap, and he didn't. Yep. Wow, can you talk about nerves of steel? I think that is phenomenal, more impressive than anything. And so I'm with you. I, ridiculous on that, but wow, hats off to Dustin Johnson. Just make the ruling wider way. Even if it's a bad ruling, he yeah. knows yeah. what he's true. He knows what he has to go he knows where he on. Stands. Yeah, he knows where he stands. Yeah. It's, just make the ruling and let him play the rest of the round. All but, right. but it, like it said, it didn't matter. Last thing, uh, the Stanley Cup might be coming here to Moorhead, Minnesota. Matt Cullen, Moorhead, Minnesota native, played for Pittsburgh, won the Stanley Cup. It might be coming here. Is that right? It sounds like that's the plan. And I, you know, earlier this week or over the weekend, he was talking about bringing it here again. He, he told a funny story. He'd actually had dinner at the Stanley Cup, where the, him and some teammates were out in Pittsburgh eating dinner, and the Stanley Cup was in the middle of the table. So, uh, to me, it's just just <laughs> great to see the life of this trophy. No other sport yeah. does it. I mean, can you imagine? You know, the NFL, you know, have the Super Bowl trophy go around or the Larry O'Brien trophy from the NBA. And I think that's what's kind of the, the, the draw of hockey. Once you win it, you have this big trophy you can carry around. And it sounds like maybe sometime in July, but no date has been yeah. settled Colin, on yet. Colin was talking to Dom Izzo on the radio this week, said it, he probably will bring the Stanley Cup here to Moorhead, Minnesota sometime this summer. So look forward to that maybe here at Buffalo Wild Wings. Anyway, when we come back, our winging it question of the week, I believe it has to deal with Carson Wentz from North Dakota State playing quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. We'll talk about that next. Benchwarmers on Midco Sports Network is presented by Buffalo Wild Wings. Welcome back to Benchwarmers. Time for our winging it question of the week, and here is Carla Metz. Thanks, Tom. Well, some big news happened around the NFL draft in this area, and I'm here with Jacob Schobinger, who's originally from Fargo, and you have a question about the second overall draft pick from this season. Yep. How well do you think Carson Wentz is going to do in Philadelphia this year? All right, Tom, let's get the panel's reaction. 
All right, Jacob wants to know, how will Carson Wentz do in his rookie season this year with the Eagles? What do you think? Well, in the ideal Philadelphia world, he won't play it down. That means Bradford or and or Daniel is fine. But I would say uh, in the case of something happening, I think he has all the physical tools. He's demonstrated that. But I, I think he will be as well prepared as anybody to step in to that role should it present itself. Uh, but by game, between games four and eight, I think he'll find the, the field, start over Sam Bradford. And I think it's going to be a mixed bag. He'll probably have a few moments of, of greatness and a few moments of not so greatness. It's just too hard to be a rookie quarterback and come in and figure it out that fast. I would agree, but I, I will say this. When he gets his chance, I, I don't think it'll be at the beginning of the year, but when he does, he'll have the respect of the teammates and the people in that organization. I think I can guarantee that. And, and they'll go down with him if they need to, if he doesn't play well, but, but he'll, he'll have a great career there. Yeah, going to be. Hopefully, he does step in there as a starter at some point this season in Philadelphia. When we come back, our poll question of the week on Bench Warmers. Bench Warmers on Midco Sports Network is presented by Buffalo Wild Wings. Welcome back to Bench Warmers, our poll question of the week. In honor of Craig Sager, if you don't know, as a sideline reporter, worked mostly for TNT on NBA games, have been fighting cancer for a long time, and they allowed him to come over to ESPN and work the sideline for one of the NBA games. But our poll question, who's your favorite sideline reporter, regardless of sport? Aaron Andrews gets 88% of the vote here at Buffalo Wild Wings today. No votes for Sager. Pierre McGuire is the hockey guy for the, uh, for the NHL. All right, fine, whatever, but I'm good. I still go with Sager. He the interviews are boring. I go with style. I love Craig Sager's jackets. He's my choice. So I go Nunn or Craig Sager. Thanks to all these guys. We will see you in Fargo next week with uh, Lee Timmerman and the boys on Bench Warmers. <laughs>